He, he is, is a very, very wise, wise man. man. He, is he is beloved, beloved by, by her, her and by many, many other, other people. people. And, and he, 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 he owns, owns a vineyard, vineyard right? right? Of course, of course we're, not we're not just, just talking, talking about, about King, King Solomon, Solomon here. here. It's, it's pointing, pointing to Christ. Christ. Okay. okay. So, so she, she falls, falls in love, in love with, him, with him and he, and he proposes, proposes to her. To her. And, and she calls, she calls him, him by the first, first name, my, my beloved, beloved, or, or you, you whom, whom I, love. I love, or in, or in some, some translations, whom my soul, my soul loves. loves. Okay, okay. So, same, same, same thing. thing. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, St. Gregory, Gregory of Nyssa, writes, writes, this is this the name, is the name I, call I call you by, by the one the whom, whom I, love. I love. For your, your name is above all things, things and, it and it is beyond all rational creatures. She doesn't call him king, she doesn't call him um Boss. Boss. <laughs> she doesn't, she doesn't call, call him, him um, the, the shepherd, shepherd, even though, even though he, he is all, all of those things. things. Right? right? This, this name declares, declares your goodness and attracts my soul, soul to you. How, how can I not, I not love, you? love you? You are, you the, are the one who loved me while I was, I was dark. And we explained that, that last time. time. So you so sacrificed your life for the sake, sake of the flock. Okay, okay. Um, um, and the fathers father say, here describes the mystery of the incarnation, in which the king of kings... Not, not disguises, disguises himself, himself here, here as, 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 a, as a shepherd, but, but he, comes he comes in the likeness, in the likeness of, of men. Okay, okay. Um, um, and, and by, by doing, doing so, so when, he when he comes to his, his vineyard, vineyard, which is the world, world many, many people, people didn't recognize, recognize him, him. His, his true identity, identity which, is which is his godhead, right? right? Our, our, our his divinity. divinity. <clears throat> but, but when, when he, he speaks, speaks the words, words of love, love to the simple girl, right? Or the simple words here of the gospel, to... The, the, the simple, simple girl, girl is, is us, us right? right? She, she sees, sees him, him, she touches him, him, she falls, she falls in, love in love with him, him and, and uh, later, later on, on she recognizes, recognizes his, his true, true identity. identity. Okay? Okay. Um, um, and, and something was, was very unique, unique about, about him when, when he begins, begins to speak. To speak right? Right? Just, Just like, like the disciples on the road, road to Emmaus, didn't, didn't our hearts burn within us? That was what they cried out out. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, so that's, that's the, first the first part, part of this, of this verse, verse, right? The second, the second part, part um, um, she, 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 she says, says, "I love, I love you're, you're, you're my beloved, beloved, but also you're the shepherd. shepherd. You, you, I need, I need to, know to know where, where you, feed you feed your flock. Your flock. Okay, the only, the only one who feeds the flock is the shepherd. shepherd. Um, um, although, although he is both king and vine dresser and groom, now we go to the to the next name that we have for our beloved Lord." And of and course, of course um, um, we can't we talk, talk about, about the shepherd, shepherd without, without talking about two main, main um, um, places, places in scripture. in scripture, Psalm 22 or 23 in, in some translations, right? And John chapter 10, where the Lord says himself, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. <clears throat> um, and Origen some, says something nice about this. He says, he is the groom because he has the bride. He is the king because he rules over all. He is the shepherd because he takes care of the sheep and feeds his flock. Right? <clears throat> so just like Solomon had multiple roles and multiple titles, God has even more. Okay? Um, and, well, where does, if Psalm 22, where, where does the shepherd feed his sheep he leads me beside still waters, right, um, by, by green pastures, and he restores my soul, right? He gives me rest. So, and she's asking for rest. Well, what is this rest? <clears throat> the, the, the church fathers, again, explain this rest to be the salvation um, that happened when the Lord rested on the cross and rested in the grave. He gave rest to all people. Right? <clears throat> and the Lord himself says in the gospel according to St. Matthew, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, you have a lot of burdens, and I will give you rest. The, sh the shepherd here is giving rest to the flock. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest, not for your bodies, but for your souls. <clears throat> for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, she wants to be fed just like all of us want to be fed by God. She wants to take rest from this world, but more importantly, from, from laboring in sin. Right? She, she also, though, wants her conversation with her beloved to be in private, and she wants to be protected from the sun. Because when do we need rest? When do we need shade? When the sun is upon us. And we'll get that, to that point in, in the next uh, slide. But 
ironically, when the Lord Jesus Christ took rest and when he said it is finished, that's when he sacrificed the most. So sometimes, um, and, and this is what we, where we go when we want to find rest, we go to the cross. So the, what is the yoke that we take upon ourselves um, so that the burden may be light? That's the yoke of fasting, the yoke of prayer, the yoke of following the commandments. Even though the commandments appear burdensome, but they are not burdensome, as the Lord says, and they're ra rather they free us. Okay? Um, so, so she's asking for the rest at noon. If you remembered in the verses before, she says that she is dark because the sun has darkened her. And we explained um, this last time um, to mean, or the fathers explained it for us, saying that we are dark because of sin. And this is the time when the sin is greatest. For example, when did the Samaritan woman go to get the water? She and when did she meet the Lord? Um, at, at, at the sixth hour, right? And, and so the sixth hour here is the time of, of, of rest and the time of salvation and the time when we need the most shade, right? Um, so that's the first reason why we have here the sixth hour. And Origen explains that the sixth hour when, when we mention the time that Christ was crucified, we don't say Friday at noon, right? But we say in the litany of the sixth hour, we say, oh, you who on the sixth day and the sixth hour, right? Because man was created on the sixth day and because this is when the Lord gives rest. <clears throat> okay. Um, and so, so the time of noon is the time of forgiveness, and the other explanation that the fathers give is that this is the time where the sun is brightest. So um, St. Augustine, for example, he says, um, noon means when there's a lot of heat and a lot of light. So this is the one also that's fervent in spirit, even though there's sin outwardly, um, or the, like there's sin um, around us, but the light and he heat here also reminds us of the time where the glory of God is most manifest. And that was manifest also on the cross. Um, Origen says, midday denotes the places of inner heart where the soul pursues the clear light of knowledge. So because it's really bright, I want the light of Christ. When Christ, the son of righteousness, shows to his church the high and lofty mysteries of his powers. So like I was saying, there's like three different explanations here of noon. The fervent in spirit, right? Or what Origen is saying here. And then the time of forgiveness, which is the cross. And then the third one is the time of sin, <laughs> because forgiveness doesn't, is not given to us unless we're sinful. Um, so His Holiness Pope Shenouda of Blessed Memory says, the sin of such a soul is due to some weakness, not lack of love. She strayed with her behavior, but not with her heart. And we were talking about this um, last week as well. So that's why this book is so pertinent to our spiritual life is because we recognize that we are weak. Like even when we pray the absolution prayer, right? We say, um, uh, we ask God to forgive the sins that we have committed intentionally and un unintentionally, but also it's some of the time we sin because of faint heartedness. Like we desire to do good, but we can't, right? Like, like St. Paul describes in the book of Romans, what I desire to do, I don't do. And that what I desire not to do, that's, that's what I practice. Um, so, the person who, who is striving for God, despite their weakness, will still be forgiven. Uh, at the end of the story, she's, she is reunited with her heavenly bridegroom, but there's still um, uh, a struggle. There's still a time where we have to pursue. And that's why a lot of this book, she talks to him every now and then, but most of the time she's running after him and she can't find him and, and they can't connect until until the end. Um, <clears throat> so then the bridegroom here responds saying, why should I be, oh sorry, she continues by saying, why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? Um, 
And the flux of the companions here reminds us of the others, right? Um, and like if we go back to the Samaritan woman and the story of the Samaritan woman, when we, um, when we fall in love with our beloved and we're running after him, other people also sometimes, like the, some of the daughters of Jerusalem, fall in love with him as well, right? <clears throat> um, but, uh, so that means there are flocks of other companions of Christ, meaning the, one, the, the ones who didn't believe and, be, and believed again, right? The same, story, the same that happens with the Samaritan woman, right? She had her personal relationship with the Lord. She believed. She gave her very quick testimony. <laughs> and because of it, they went to him. And after, <coughs> excuse me, after they went to him, what happened? Um, they believed themselves. And then they said, we, didn't, we, we were not believing because of what you said. We believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. Now we have the same relationship that you did. Um, we just needed someone to encourage us to get started, to point us in the right direction. And now we understand more fully your love with your groom. Okay? <clears throat> um, and then keep in mind, she says, well, I'm still veiling myself. So the veil here has a couple of meanings. <laughs> One is that I have a, pr a private relationship with God, like we just explained, right? The inner sanctuary, as... Um, some of the fathers explain. And, and other fathers say, um, well, go back to what St. Paul says to the Second Corinthians, and he, when he talks about the, the Jews in the Old Testament where, who were blinded from seeing the fulfillment of Scripture in Christ, right? He says when they read the Old Testament, there's a veil before their eyes, and they can't comprehend um, that the scripture is pointing to Christ, right? They still don't understand, <clears throat> right? Um, that's what uh, St. Jerome alludes to here, because she still doesn't have the perfect... Who takes away the veil in the wedding? <laughs> the groom. Um, and he's the only one who has... Well, maybe not, it's not part of the rite, as far as I know, <laughs> in the church, but this shows that the only one who can see me clearly and know me clearly... Is, is the one who is most intimate with me, and the one who has permission, <laughs> in a sense. Like, even if you notice in the story of, uh, I believe it's Isaac and Rebecca, right? When, when she comes to him, because the servant brings her, and they're not married yet, um, she, she sees him from, who is that? Oh, that's, that's your future groom. So she puts the veil on her. He, he's not permitted yet, <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> So uh, His Holiness, again, uh, Pope Shenouda of Blessed Memory says, Sometimes a person cries out with these words in times of slackness, one feels forsaken by the divine grace. In such times a person feels the loss of, his, of her first zeal and familiarity and love. So he says to the Lord, why should I be as one who veils herself? So this is, the, again, the struggle with the person who loves God but is still far. Where are the days of spirituality? When I used to say, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. We'll get to that in a, in a couple chapters. Where are the days when my prayers were deep and his words were sweet in my mouth like honey? When I raised my hands and my soul became filled. Sometimes even we, we say this when we look back in our life and, and our spiritual um, relationship with God over the years or even over the last year. <laughs> and sometimes people especially feel this more during the Great Lent um, when they were like, I remember last Lent was great, and Busco was great, and, and what happened over the year, I declined somehow, I need to go back. Um, so th this is, um, as His Holiness is saying, is the description of the inner voice um, that speaks to the Lord, saying, I'm, I, I, my shepherd, I want to return to you, even though I'm very far away from you, but I love you. Um, I'm, sh I'm far away from my, with my conduct, but not with my heart. Um, you know that I love you, even though my activity, my service, my worship is, is not where it should be. Um, and even the image that you created me with is, is disfigured. Um, but I still long to be restored 
to your likeness. <clears throat> um, and then he speaks, right? Then he says, okay, first of all, <laughs> um, you, since you do not know where I am or where I'm going, know first that you are the most beautiful among all women, right? Um, you need to realize the potential of the beauty that you have within, um, that I created you in my likeness and uh, my image. Um, and that's why, in a sense, she's the fairest. So some of the fathers say, when we compare fairest among women, this is the soul of the believer who is baptized compared to the non-believers, not the other believers, because all the believers are most beautiful. Okay. Um, so again, he's speaking here to the church um, more specifically uh, than just one individual. Um, so then uh, he, he says, okay, you are the fairest among women and you do not know yourself yet. So what do you need to do? Two things. You need to follow and feed. Follow in the footsteps of your flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. Um, so uh, when we say follow and feed, there's two Again, <laughs> at least two from, from the Father's main explanations. See, see how almost every symbol has more than one explanation. It's kind of like the book of Revelation here. Um, so following an, uh, in the footsteps of the flock is f one explanation that the Father's give is following in the footsteps of the saints, the, uh, the other believers, the ones who have come before us, whether the ones who have departed in the faith successfully are the ones that are ahead of us, like our father of confession, maybe, or a spiritual guide, or uh, as St. Paul says in the Hebrews, those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, cons considering the outcome of their conduct, right? <clears throat> um, so this is following the lives of the saints and the tradition of the church. Right? Um, and notice here also that he says, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats. So here he's indirectly saying, yes, you're beautiful, you're most fair, but at the same time, you don't have sheep, you have goats. <laughs> Why? Because you're not there yet. You're not following properly yet. So here God gives us the dual, dual message uh, before when even, and she knows it because last time we said, she, she, I'm dark but beautiful, right? I'm dark because my actions are not reflecting the desire within, but I'm beautiful because by God's grace, he forgives me and he makes me like himself. Um, and so this is kind of the same message that the church gives, we have to be disciples. Uh, there's a story of St. Arsenius um, who was, uh, excelled in wisdom and virtue and knowledge, um, even though he was, you know, living in the wilderness as, as a monk. But his fame became well known, and the emperor brought him. Uh, I put an icon of, uh, <laughs> uh, of Saint Maximus and Domedius because they didn't have one of, of Saint Arsenius. But the idea, is, I, the, the idea is here is the same. In, in this story, uh, the emperor brings St. Arsenius to teach his kids, Honorius and uh, Arcadius. Um, and one day he was passing by the emperor um, just to check in to see what was happening um, with the education. <laughs> how, how are you coming along? And he sees, as is typical, even like right now, the teacher standing, speaking, right? And the, the, those who are learning, sitting and maybe they were sitting on their throne, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> and he stopped and he said, uh, uh, no, this is wrong. <laughs> so he said, Arsenius, you, you are the, the elder, um, you are the teacher, you sit and they will stand. <laughs> um, why? To, um, to remind us of the spirit of discipleship. Uh, there's, uh, I can't remember which saint story, but the same thing happened. Um, Whereas, I think it was the patriarch um, who, who was learning and um, uh, 
by the Spirit, there was a message sent to him saying, no, you need to humble yourself if you want to learn. <laughs> um, okay, we'll, we'll move on. The, the other aspect of the following and feeding, uh, Saint, um, sorry, Origen, the scholar, says that um, the Shulamite woman is, is the person who wrongfully follows the, the wrong teachers. So here the shepherds are not referenced to the saints, but um, the, the teachers who bring us, who are not the good shepherd. Um, and so this is in reference to not following the, the proper orthodox teaching. Um, and he says, this is the, the Shulamite is the person who, who wrongfully follows other teachers, the other shepherds, and they neglect the wisdom and purity, which are the sheep, and that's why they're following their own inclinations and they're feeding the goats. They're giving the doctrine um, that, they, like, like Scripture says, because they have itching ears, they heap up teachers for themselves. So because you want to hear something that tells you, oh, you're okay, no problem, just do this, <laughs> and usually it goes against the teaching of the church, then you follow that teaching because it makes sense to you, but more it's like uh, telling, comforting you that you don't have to change your way. Um, <clears throat> So this is what, uh, how Origen explains. And then he says, uh, she chooses a lifestyle of the worldly common, common souls, um, which is among the women, right? Even though she is holy, because she is beloved from before, um, and uh, she has even visited his chambers, which is uh, symbolic of the church. Um, okay. Um, later on, then, the... The groom says, I have compared you, my love, to my filly among the chariots, a pharaoh. Um, and again, <laughs> there's two explanations, but we'll try to be quick for the sake of time. Um, the first explanation is, um, in the book of Revelation, the king of kings and lord of lords sits on a, a white horse, um, going out, uh, as St. John explains, I looked be and beheld a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So he was victorious, and he is being victorious, right? None other than the Lord. <clears throat> and so um, one of the fathers, I think it's Origen, he says, this is the filly among Pharaoh's chariots, right? The one who is fairest among women, like, who excels above all other souls, because they are even though there's the burden of Pharaoh, who is, you know, the devil around them, right? Um, they have learned, or this horse has learned to submit under the yoke of uh, the king. And this is, uh, this is what we remember um, just a few slides ago when we were talking about um, in Matthew when the Lord says, take my yoke upon you. Um, <clears throat> The, the other explanation here Origen gives, I myself take both the horses and the horsemen to be none other than those souls who accept the bridle of his discipline uh, because they are, they are submitting themselves to wherever the rider of the horse wants to go, right? To bear the yoke of his sweetness and are led by the Spirit of God. In so doing, they find salvation, okay? Um, so there's no negativity here when it comes to various chairs. Um, We'll, uh, there's only a couple slides left, but here, um, skip a, a few verses. Um, While the king is at his table, my smite guard sends forth its fragrance. A bundle of myrrh is beloved to me. Um, and so here, the king is at his table. Here's the table of the, the mysteries, the altar. My spike guard sends forth its fragrance, similar to the woman who, who offered spike guard at the feet of Christ before his passion, right? And a bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me, which is one of the spices, as we know, that symbolizes his suffering, and he was buried with the myrrh. Right? <clears throat> so St. Augustine puts all of these together, and he says, you are the table, he's talking about us, right? The, the, the Christian. You are inside the chalice. This is the, what the church offers through the mystery of the altar offering the sacrifices or the oblations to God, she offers herself in his oblation. Uh, Romans chapter 12, um, the living sacrifice. As long as the church is the body of the head, 
and she learns to offer herself through him because he is the one who offered himself to her. Okay, <clears throat> finally, um, th there's a lot of verses that we've skipped because the symbolism is repeated um, in those verses um, uh, in, in, in future chapters. So don't worry, we're, we'll get like the, uh, where he says you have dove's eyes, for example. Um, we'll get to that. Then, uh, towards the end of the chapter, my beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyards of En Gedi. <laughs> uh, behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair or beautiful. Um, and so Ibn Tadrus, in, in his commentary, he says, the king holds on to the cross as the scepter of his kingdom, and the queen holds her bridegroom with her hand until his characteristics and the sign of his kingdom are imprinted on her. So going back to the cross, when we cleave to the cross, we become Christ-like, and we carry the cross. And so, as you know, that the henna is, is, is red, and it's used in Middle Eastern custom before the, the marriage um, with the bride, right? <clears throat> with her hands. And so when we cleave to Christ who died for us, right? And he is ruddy or he is red, then our hands become red. That's what Abuna Tadras is explaining here. Um, <clears throat> and that's why my beloved to me is a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyards of En Gedi, okay? Abuna continues by saying, she will not become a queen until she carries the signs of the cross and sacrifices herself to the point of bloodshed, um, like resisting sin un until bloodshed, that St. Paul says to the Hebrews. Um, he says, this is the secret of her strength and her beauty, um, which is the cross. Therefore, the king communes with her saying, beloved, you are fair, beloved, you are fair. Um, you have the dove's eyes. And, and we'll get to that again uh, next time, God willing. Um, any questions? I know we went through a lot of symbolism, and there's a lot of um, uh, beautiful messages that each verse and each word uh, reminds us of. We don't have time to go in, but I just wanted to kind of give an example of how we're supposed to read um, this book. And that's why, as we said last time, the fathers encourage us uh, not to, especially in the beginning of our spiritual uh, growth, not necessarily to read um, this book with, without that symbolic um, or typological interpretation because then we will come out with a completely different understanding of what this uh, scripture means to us. May God give us grace to help us continue to understand God's love for us so it will inflame our hearts more with love for him and run after him until we become um, renewed in his image. And glory be to him now and from to the age of the age of the we we'll pray, Lord, make us worthy to pay thankfully our Father.